Hi, this is Mark Arnold, and welcome to another episode of Fun Ideas Podcast. And on mm-hmm. today's show, I have a legendary, I think, <laughs> animator <laughs> named Tom Cito. At least he's legendary to me. Uh, <laughs> so welcome to the show. How are you? Okay. How you doing, Mark? I'm doing very good myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had some various questions about uh, different things you've done in your career. Um, but the main thing I wanted to ask about, and I bought this book years ago, mm-hmm. is called, it has a plastic cover, so it shines too much. Drawing <laughs> the Line <laughs> um, is about uh, your uh, experiences or the information about your uh, about the Disney uh, animation union as strikes and things like that. But uh, I think you cover more things. Now, there's a book that just came out, and I interviewed this gentleman on the last episode, and you may have seen it, called The Disney Revolt. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> so no, I don't know I if you helped, had a chance. I come out with that. So. Okay. So I don't know if you've had a chance to read this one yet, but oh, yeah. uh, I'm just kind of <laughs> curious before we kind of go into your career and everything. Uh, how do how do they compare? <laughs> oh, well, you, you know, you know, what you could. Um, Jay had a lot of great sources that that he drew on and stuff, and um, I, I, you know, including mine. And and uh, I mean, when I started, nobody had really written about the strike. You know, right. I mean, everything about the strike uh, of nineteen forty one was from you know the Disney the Disney PR machine, you know, you, you know, sort of point of view. So like, you know, Walt had a wonderful company. Everybody was happy. But then a couple of commies tried to spoil everything. Then World War II happened. And you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, when I talk, I mean, I was fortunate enough that when I started my career, um, a lot of the golden age artists were ending their careers. And I noticed that um, even in their old age, they still bore grudges about 1941. It still bothered them, you know, mm-hmm. like I used to hang out with Maurice Noble, who was the uh, art director of all the Chuck Jones stuff. And and Maurice was at Disney's and he was a striker. And um, and, and I remember saying to him, like, uh, Maurice, I, I was working at Disney at the time. And I said, Maurice, why don't you come over to why don't you come over to the studio? We'll have lunch. We'll we'll get together all your your old students. You know, they call them the Noble Boys, you know, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, you know, we, we'll have a nice time. And Maurice goes, no, ah, ah, my run out of Frank Thomas, you know. And I'm like, wow, man, like what what is this thing that these guys are in their 80s, they're at the edge of you know, you know, eternity, and they're still mad at each other. Yeah. Uh, best based on this one, you know, summer of 1941. And so that kind of s- stimulated my interest in wanting to go back and look at this stuff, you know. And um, I was also, you know, good friends with Art Babbitt, you know, who was the, the strike leader. Yeah. And, um, and, 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 you know, and when I started to hear their stories of things, they were so diametrically opposed to like the official view that suddenly I was getting like, well, okay, wait a minute. There's two, I'm getting a Rashomon thing here, you know, <laughs> like what's, <laughs> what's going on, you know, you know, and um and, and you know, and and it led me to kind of like expand, you know, in the story. And it's and it's funny because um, when I when I turned in the book, it, uh, you know, it, you know, and hit stuff about you know the mafia and the bomb threats and all kinds of things going on. Um, it, you know, the the publisher, you know, wrote me back and goes, "Did this really happen?" <laughs> I go, "Yeah, yeah, it did. You know, it's <laughs> it's, it, it's Holly, hidden Hollywood history. You know, I mean, it's a, you know." Uh, Hollywood's kind of famous for like writing its own uh, it's it's its own legends for itself, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. and and it's funny, you know, you know, because when I did the research, like, I, you know, I was also friends with the with the with the people who didn't strike, you know, like I was good friends with Mark Davis and Frank and Ollie and and, you know, Joe Grant and a lot of those folks. And so I heard their side and I heard the striker side. And it was very interesting to see, you know. When you put it all together, it was like a Greek tragedy, where if everybody stuck to their to their guns, if everybody, you know, you know stayed with their principles, the inevitable disaster was going to happen, anyway. You know, and, and and also the other thing is, I noticed that a lot of um, uh, people who write Disney history a lot of times tend to put Disney in a bubble. You know, like 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 this is the happy place, the happiest place on earth, and nothing bad ever happens here. 
and, and you know and and it's like no disney was part of hollywood you know walt disney went to every opening he went to every society event you know if you if you you know you research um old varieties or old trade papers whenever there was like a major event in town walt disney was there you know mm -hmm. you know he was not like isolated off on a on a right. mountain somewhere you, you know and and the people too it's like it's like you, you know people go home after work you know it's like after work you you know you get together with your friends at a restaurant or a bar or back in the 30s and 40s when people couldn't afford restaurants they'd have house parties Mm -hmm. where where you know everybody would bring a bottle and uh, and get some records and you know and and uh, you know dance and have a party and so you know the disney artists would meet their friends at mgm and and warner brothers and screen gems and they'd all talk about stuff and in the late 30s everybody was talking about unionization Mm -hmm. You know, because that's, that's like everything was happening. That's the, the Directors Guild was forming, the Writers Guild was forming. So, so to try to do a history of Disney's isolated from the rest of Hollywood is not telling the whole story. You have to kind of wrap it all together. And, right. you know, everything that was happening at that time, you know, just like you, you know, Disney's um, output was very much affected by by the war in Europe. You, you know, like when they did Snow White. You know, it was the last comparative year of peace. So, so you know, Snow White did really well all around the world. By the time the next movies came out, like Fantasia and Pinocchio, you know, you know, Hitler was already dominating Europe. And um, I believe in, uh, they said that by the end of 1940, Disney movies could only be shown in, in England and Portugal. Mm -hmm. That was it, you know, you know, oh. and then France, Germany, and Italy were like really heavy theater going, you know, audiences. Mm -hmm. So, so it really hurt his overseas, you know, you know, you know, bottom line at that time, and likely, and the same thing was happening in Asia. You know, if you're Australian or you were Philippine or or, or from Singapore, you know, you know, you were too busy running from bombs to like, you, you know, go watch a movie. <laughs> <laughs> right, but it wasn't just Disney; it was all studios, weren't they all yeah. affected? Yeah, it's like, exactly. yeah. um, and I guess to to. To, uh, go on your point it's like uh it, it seems like i think the reason why people think that about disney nowadays is being like its own thing is kind of disney's own publicity it's like we're separate from them we do animation they do films and other yeah. things you know we had our nine old men and they're just a bunch of hacks and you know yeah. it's just like you know, it, it's, so it's their own mythology they're kind of promoting. And of course, it's easy to believe after a while that, you know, they were like their own island and everybody else uh, yeah. did everything else, you know, but, I, you know, I, I get it. It's like, yeah, and I think that's the difference. Probably I answered my own question, but it's been a while since I read this, uh, is that you kind of cover the whole industry, the industry as a whole for yeah. a long period of time, whereas this is really just the 1940 one yeah. strike yeah. you know yeah, he, felt, he really focused on the strike yeah you know yeah. The, the the other thing that always used to get me and and i clash sometimes even with other disney historians is there's a certain cadre of uh, uh and i mean you, you know i'm a member of the hyperion historical alliance and i'm a member of all the disney scholars and stuff and i go to a lot of you know disney um uh, events and things like that and um you know and they're all great people you know and they're all terrific you know scholars but there's a certain group of um, the, the the I call them the Saint Walt crowd, you know, like there's the crowd are like Walt Disney is infallible, you know, it is, he's like Mother Teresa with a with, with a cigarette, you know, it's right. Funny. It's like the, the man could do no wrong. And, and, and I think that does a disservice to the real man, you know, like I, yeah. I'm not out to tear him down or insult him, right. but when I talk to the people who interacted with him, who worked with him, he sounded like a normal guy, you know, yeah. he, he smoked cigarettes. He liked to drink after work. He would swear on occasion, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, he wasn't a, he wasn't a, you know, St. Francis, you know, he was a normal guy, you know, he bore grudges, you know, he, he, he bugged them about people, you know, but there's a famous story about um, when, when, when Disney first pitched the, uh, you know, first threw out the idea that we're going to do a feature length animated film, this thing, Snow White. And, and and you know and and it was seen as a terrific gamble because nobody had done a feature length cartoon yet, and nobody had done a cartoon with some serious motifs in it. You know, like she she she's dead at one point. You know, right. And um, 
and, and, and the, the studio was very uh, the artists were very worried because things were moving so well with the with the Mickey's shorts and with all the other shorts and all and why should we do such a long throw the dice you know you know if it fails we're unemployed during the great depression <laughs> you know? right <laughs> it's like really wor- you know people are worried about it yeah. and um it's a story about Disney at one point showed like the work reels like the work in progress to the to the staff and 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 handed out paper and said anybody write down any notes any suggestions or something and um and, and you know and he was going through the notes later and one of the notes was why don't we stick to shorts <laughs> you know? and this like bugged him so much so that 10 years later during a a, a story meeting about another another film Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he was sitting around talking with his lead animators and the story artists, and they were throwing around ideas. And one person, uh, uh, you know, expressed hesitation about, uh, uh, um, you know, one point. And Walt said, are you the son of a bitch who said, let's stick to shorts? <laughs> Look, he remembered that from like 10 years ago. Like it still mm-hmm. bothered him. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you know, I, what I what I find fascinating about Walt Disney is that. It's not about like or hate. You admire the guy, you know, you know, but but admire the whole person, yeah. you know. Um, uh, David Swift, who directed the Haley Mills movies, uh, you know, Parent Trap and all, was was telling me once about um, he uh, when he started directing his first film for, for Disney because he had, what he had done was that uh, he was in the strike. But then, but then he was put off by the um, militancy of the strike leaders, like they kind of offended him. So, so he crossed the picket line, went back to work. <laughs> and uh, John, John Hubley keyed his car, like sort of like scratched his car. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, af- you know, after this, you know, so soon after the strike, you know, the war happened, and you know, and he was involved with that. And then he he went east and got involved in early television. And started writing scripts, and he used to write for the Mister Peeper shows and things right. like that, and, and and got to his first direction was like television direction, mm-hmm. and uh, and and uh, on a trip back west, he he ran into Walt Disney, and Disney was like, uh, you, you know, I'd like you to work for me, you know, and direct a film, you know, and and, and it would be a live action film. He was like, well, okay, you know, so so he was saying like his first day on the set. Uh, he, you know, he had like 80 people on the set and all and did doing their first setups. He he, re, he remembered he uh, left some he, he left some notes, uh, uh, in, you know, uh, in his office and he got up himself and ran up to his office to get his notes. And as he was running back to the soundstage, uh, Disney was in the hallway and, 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 and he was like, hey, Swifty, come here. I want to talk to you about something. And, and, and he was like, well, you know, Walt, I really can't pause you know you know because i got 80 people down at, uh, on the set and they're waiting for me and i, I don't want to keep them waiting and walt goes hey my goddamn studio come on wow <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> yes sir <laughs> yes sir <laughs> you know i mean that guy sounds normal <laughs> you know that yeah. guy sounds like a regular person you, you yeah. know and, and and again too it's like it's like i'm not i don't think it cheapens him I yep. think it just makes him more like a, a whole human being, yeah. you know. But I mean, Disney himself was aware of the fact that he created this image of Uncle Walt, you know, that mm-hmm. that nice person that that appeared in our TV sets on Sunday nights, mm-hmm. and uh, you, you know, you know, he was like a sort of a, um, uh, you know, a. a, a um, a non-religious Santa Claus, you know, <laughs> kind of person. And, and 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 you know his famous quote, you know, that he said. He goes, "I'm not Walt Disney." I said, "I, I Walt Disney doesn't smoke. I smoke. Walt <laughs> Disney doesn't drink. I drink." Mm-hmm. It, you know, meaning that he created that character. You know, just right. like Marilyn Monroe used to talk about her character in the third person, and mm-hmm. uh, John Wayne did also. Yeah. It, 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 you know, like if you were if you're good friends with John Wayne, you called him Duke. Mm-hmm. You know, you didn't call him John. Mm-hmm. You know, he considered John Wayne his character. You know, mm-hmm. and and I think there's the same thing with Walt Disney. But you know, that again too. On on the other side, I cannot help but admire that talking to the to the people who interacted with him. Mm-hmm. That uh, even the people who he he was uh, he became his enemy. Like even the people who crossed him, mm-hmm. all admired him as a person, and they all said they all felt that connection with him. You know, mm-hmm. they all. 
you know, Joe Grant, who who quit the studio in 1949 in a in a political thing, and uh, and it was written out of Lady and the Tramp and stuff. Um, he came back to the studio for Aladdin in 1990, and and and, and we got to be good friends because he, you know he liked to talk politics, not just tr- you know film trivia, mm-hmm. and and uh, and we would sit around and talk, and 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 he once said to me, he says, the difference between you and I is, you you, you work for the you were for the Disney company. I work for Walt Disney. <laughs> okay. You know, you know, yep. so, 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 something I learned when I was young uh, from a lot of the older guys was like, uh, never argue with a guy with, with silver hair. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you ever meet Walt? In any, any yeah, time? No, I think I was oh, only okay. 10 years old when he died. Yeah. And, well, you never yeah. know. You might have seen him in Disneyland or something. I don't know. You know yeah. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I did meet a lot of people at yeah. that time and stuff, but uh, and I was good friends with Roy Disney, you know, with the nephew mm-hmm. and everything, and and the other members of the Disney family, and um, you know, but it is it. it uh, I was very fortunate in that when I began my career, a lot of golden age people were ending their careers, mm-hmm. so I had right. a chance to overlap them, you know. Mm-hmm. So, like on, on on the movie Raggedy Ann and Andy, uh, Richard Williams had me at one point assisting Grim Natwick. And it's like I was like nineteen, and Grimm was like eighty-seven, right. <laughs> you know? and I'm like, this is the guy who who designed Betty Boop. Like right. he sat down on my <laughs> piece of paper and created Betty Boop. You know, he he had a great story about about how he created Betty because he he lived to be one hundred. God bless him. Right, right. And and um and, and he loved to tell stories. He was a great storyteller, and um and he wants to describe how he designed Betty because um he he had worked at, uh, I guess after World War One. He, you know, he went to Paris and studied art, you in, know, in France and all before coming back. So he was very good at drawing uh, the female figure. Mm. And uh, you know, Seamus Culhane said he says what's great with Grimm was that was that up to that point when people animated uh, characters running, and, and they had to turn around, uh, what they would do is that they make the character run out of screen, then turn around and then run the other way like that. Mm. Grimm actually made people turn around in space. Cool. It, yeah, you know, yeah. which is like you know it's hard but you know but you know when you uh, you know it's a matter of of your drawing ability that you can make that happen but but grim described about how he designed betty he says well we, you know he's like 90 years old and he used to play up the old man thing he'd go oh, <laughs> you know, if, he would do that as a joke you know you know like that so he was a very sharp man so um but he would say, well, we had this dog named Bimbo, and they wanted Bimbo to have a girlfriend. And they wanted him to be, they wanted her to be another little dog. So I designed this like uh, French poodle type, you know, with, with spit curls. And the and their earrings would be would be her 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 poodle ears, you know, and then and then when I got to her body, I was like, <laughs> That's all he said. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, well, let's go back a little bit further in your career. Um, so you you like attended everywhere. I, I looked on Wikipedia and on your website, and I'm like, this guy's done everything. It's like you know, it's like you went to like the right schools and right. <laughs> And you worked, you worked, were, were taught by the right people. And it's like, oh, I'm jealous. Anyway, <laughs> so, I mean, uh, so it says high school art and design and school of visual arts. And it says Harvey Kurtzman was one of your instructors. So I'll yeah. start with him. What was he like? I just recently finished a mad book. So I'm like, I uh, never met him either. Yeah. You know, so I'm curious about uh, what he was like. Harvey, Harvey, Harvey was a lovely, was a lovely man. He, you know, he was, he was very sweet and everything. And it's kind of funny, you know, because he was doing stuff like Little Annie Fanny and a sort of like girly, mag- you know, stuff for Playboy and everything. And he's a very happily middle class married man and everything. It's like, no, no, no big deal, you know. And, um, um, you know, and he he was great at promoting other cartoonists and recognizing people's ability and, um, you know, discovering people and and what what I was always surprised about was, was that as somebody who was like such a, an innovator, he was a great listener. Like he loved, he loved like just sort of listening to people talk and he loved listening to artists and seeing, you know, you know, like, like channeling the right person to the right job and saying like, you know, 
you should do this, you know, kind, kind of thing. And, and, you know, and I noticed that even early on, you know, you know, when I was like taking his class, I think he sensed something in me as a teacher because, because he, he, he loved to like share tips about teaching with me. You know, he, he'd sit there and he goes, uh, because after class, he loved to go for a beer before before he caught the last train to Mount Vernon, you know, this is like, you know, Mad Men era, you know, you know, it's like everybody took the train up to the, to the suburbs. And um, anyway, so, so we were sitting in the, in this, uh, in this, uh, you know, pub in, uh, on 23rd street and, and, and Harvey would look at me and go, my theory of teaching is got a 15 week class, bring in five guest speakers. <laughs> you know, pros love to talk. Students never get enough of pros. And you can sit in the back and have a cigarette. <laughs> well, we can't smoke anymore. Yeah, you know. But Harvey was so well co connected. He, you know, like he brought he brought in Terry Gillum. He brought in R. Crumb. He brought in Al Jaffe. You know, he brought in Russ Heath. And I was like, oh my God, these people are more. These people are gods. You know, it's just like. I, well, what's just, insane I, is you know uh, all the people he grew up with. I mean, it's yeah. like that's a a laundry list of people too. You know, know. Like, I, I know. <laughs> went it, to school with. I mean, it, it's almost kind of like in your situation. Yeah, <laughs> so that's why yeah. I'm like, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now you eventually worked for him on. Uh, didn't you submit gags to Little Annie yeah. Fanny at one point? Yeah. Uh, did you actually submit like complete stories or just little no I was, gags I, to I, punch it up or something? Yeah, I was a gag guy. So like, so like Harvey would write the main theme. He'd make, he'd write the main story, and then and and and, sh and show me the rough. And then and then I would submit lots of like uh, side gags, you know, because Harvey's Harvey's little Annie Fanny had lots of little gags all around, you know, right. the main story. So he wanted all of those things, you know, you know, and and you know, for 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 a kid and, and you know, student, you know, this was terrific, mm -hmm. you, you know, because you, you learned stuff that you thought was hysterical. He had no reaction at all, mm -hmm. and then sometimes something you, I just threw in just to fill out the envelope, you know, you know, to fill fill the envelope. You know, he loved. You know, it was like so. Okay, so I learned. I learned about humor from that. You know, uh -huh. and plus you would get the check with the Playboy, you know, symbol <laughs> on it. And, and I remember I bring it to a bank, you know, you know, and the teller would like, <laughs> and I'm like, it's, it's airbrush, you know, it's a, it's amazing what they could do, you know. <laughs> You didn't get any written credit for that, right? So, no. so like I have the two collections that Dark Horse put out a few years back. So, yeah. how would one tell, yeah, you know, a gag oh. that you did? Is there a way oh. to tell, or is it just too assimilated and it just looks like yeah, person and elder? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's mostly it's mostly sight gags. You know, okay. it, it was like it was like one of the. Uh, little Annie Fanny at the at, at the sex clinic, and then there was another one I forgot uh, a gay bar or something like that. But uh, but but uh, yeah, it was things like you know um, uh, uh, the, uh, a girl uh, you know next to next next to nothing, uh, uh, you know by the entrance to the to the um, uh, to this little sex farm, and she's um, bending over to pick us some flowers right next to a sign that said "Park here." You yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right. That's, so that's the that's, type of thing I'll take a look at. See level. if I can yeah, yeah. see if I can yeah. find it, figure out what you may yeah. have written. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, it was all like around um, seventy-five. I think it was like seventy-five, seventy-six. The summer. Uh, that's, that's now, did you work on any of the artwork or anything like that, or no? Um, no, no. That was Will okay. Elder. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I know yeah. he had help, you know, from like Russ Heath and even Jack yeah. Davis over the years. So oh, I yeah. thought maybe there would be you know, mm. uncredited it would be nice. yeah, it would be nice. <laughs> drawing help, but you know, okay. <laughs> yeah. More ideas. You, you know, one interesting story with Harvey was um, uh, Harvey used to take credit for, for helping create little Annie Fanny. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm sorry. Uh, uh, he used to take credit for, for, um, for creating Monty Python. Oh, okay. Because he said he hired John Cleese and, and, and uh, Terry Gillum was one of his students. Right, and, and so Terry Gillum was working as like an intern, you know, for him on uh, on it was either Humbug or one of the. It was help. The, you know, it was help at that point. Oh, help. Okay, yeah, That's, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 and, and Cleese had just come over from England looking for work. It was like you know, a young actor. So so he hired him for those photo fumetti th 
things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and and they got to know each other and they were friends. And then later on, you know, you know, the, the, the two of them drifted back to England and then connected up with the Cambridge, you know, you, you know, you know, crowd, you know, Terry Gillum and uh, I'm sorry, uh, Terry Jones and uh, Michael Palin and stuff. And anyway, so Harvey liked to tell a story. So jump ahead to 2003. It, you know, Harvey's already passed away. And um, I was on the Warner Brothers lot working on the Looney Tunes back in action with Brendan Fraser. Mm -hmm. And um, and and I, 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 I got to be on set a lot because I was like the, the animation uh, uh, liaison, you know, like coordinator with the live action crew. And um, anyway, they hired John Cleese for a cameo. Uh, uh, that they were going to use in, in, in like one uh, one sketch with uh, there in Paris, uh, Brendan and Jenna Elfman and by the Eiffel Tower in his little cafe, and they wanted uh, Cleese to come out as a French waiter and 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 do his snooty waiter, you, you know his his thing that he did in Holy Grail, you, you know, right, you know, right, kiss of other people's bottoms, right. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and you know, so he came out for for like a day shoot. I, I don't think they used it. Uh, they wound up not. Using I don't remember it. him in the film, so no. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Unless it's on an outtake reel on there, but I have not. Yeah. I didn't think it was in the film. Yeah, yeah, it's a shame, man. Everything because you know there's a lot of good stuff. You go, that, that would have been nice, but oh well. Did but, you get a chance uh, to talk to him then about that? Is yes. that what you're okay? Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, this is the thing. I actually thought, what the hell? Uh, he, you know, I went over to his trailer and knocked on the door, and he was very friendly. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, we have a mutual acquaintance. We both work for Harvey Kurtzman, mm -hmm. and, and you know, and 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 John Cleese. <laughs> oh yes, Harvey, Harvey. Oh, yeah. wonderful man! Uh, I met Gillum working for him, and I'm like, <laughs> "Shit, that you're right." <laughs> it's like corroborating <laughs> sources. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. <laughs> he may have come to terms with it, but I remember interviews with Cleese probably back when he was still with Python, like in the '80s, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he 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 hated when people would bring up that Barbie doll Fumetti. He's like, no, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know. But I think enough time has passed. Is like. You have to, you know, live with your early material as well as your later stuff. So. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Everybody, everybody has some embarrassing things, you know, yeah. that you just kind of like, oh, yeah, that I was yeah. silly. You know, I mean, so. it makes it stand out because they did Fumetti's like all, all the time. But honestly, that's the one that really stands out for me. I think there's one with Woody Allen also. But for the most yeah. part, the Fumetti's are just kind of, oh, OK, you know, <laughs> it wasn't my favorite part of Help Magazine. So it was right. like, you know, yeah. that's probably why. But um, going back to you. OK, so <laughs> um, before you were in all these uh, different schools and everything, did you automatically have an act for art and everything like that? Or what was your... Uh you know yeah, I, I think i i think i always liked drawing as i was a kid okay. and, and and you know you know i went all through public schools and um and i noticed early on that the the class artist doesn't get beat up as much as the other ones so <laughs> so, so draw pictures <laughs> you know? and at first well you, you know as a kid growing up in new york city in in, in, the, in the in the 50s and 60s the big thing was newspapers you, you, you know you get the sunday funnies and you know, I sit there and read, you know, um, Dick Tracy and Potsy and Moon Mullins and Little Abner, and 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 I originally thought, well, I want to be a strip cartoonist. You know, I want to make that kind of stuff. You, you know, mm -hmm. and and that's what I was really obsessed with. And uh, then, of course, that was the golden age of Marvel too. So you would pick up, you know, you know, I had a, a whole run of Spider Mans and and Fantastic Fours, and I love the artwork and stuff. You mm -hmm. know. But I never saw myself as a comic book artist. I always saw myself more as a as a comic strip type person. I go towards, I I always tended to to go towards comedy. I was more of a comedy guy, you know, person. And um, actually, it was in it was at art and design in, in in the you know in the eleventh grade that uh, that a teacher showed me how to animate. You know how to make the how to make my drawings move, and I just kind of fell in love. I thought this is a great. This is amazing, you know. And then I found out later you could get a job doing this stuff. <laughs> like, oh, you could you could actually do this for a living. So you, you know. didn't consider animation before that, then, uh, no. or did no. you uh, watch cartoons when you were young or pay oh, yeah. attention? Oh, okay, so yeah. it wasn't like you I, were. You know. oh, yeah. I was one of those, um, uh, you know, boob tube babies who got up at six a.m. and I looked at the screen when it was snow, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Waiting, waiting for the test pattern to come on. <laughs> hey, I'm a, I'm a little bit younger than you, but it's like yeah. I still was doing this early seventies. So yeah, it's like yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, I remember all that, all that, all that stuff. You, you know, and um, you, you know, the, the 
the thing the sociologists were always worried about you know kids brains rotting watching tv all the day <laughs> well this right. is this, this is this is <laughs> generation we, 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 we watched all that stuff you know yep. now all my students are on phones you know you right know, exactly i walk around and all the kids are mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly I saw, I saw a great gag cartoon recently of like if um if the titanic had sunk this year instead of in 1912 uh uh the, the boat's going down and all these people are in the water like they'd be filming it <laughs> yeah, filming it sink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well um let's see then after working with Kurtzman, you worked with Seamus Colhane for a while. Is that the next yeah. thing? Is that and what was he like? Oh, Seamus was wonderful. He was a, I mean, it was a big influence on my career. He was very, um, uh, you know, he, he was very an irascible old gent, uh, rascal, but but he liked to, to be that. He was a very uh, a very big personality, and um, it's amazing because when you think about it, it's like uh, he, you know he got started in silent film. He was like a, he was like a runner for John Randolph Bray in like 1928 or something like wow. that. It was like 14 or something like that. And, and he said the reason why he became an animator at Fleischer was was because when when things went to sound, uh, his mother made him take violin lessons so he could read music. And they and and at that time they used to print the music right on the exposure sheet, like right in the, you know for the animators. And and a lot of them didn't read music, you know. So <laughs> so he got a break that way. So he he was over at um, and Fleischer, and then went to Disney's, you know, for Snow White mm-hmm. and, and and Pinocchio, and then you know, and then drifted back uh, back east. Uh, so that had an amazing career. That he did some of the earliest television commercials, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, it it was just amazing picking his brain, you know, you know, because it, uh, you know, I think that's kind of like where I, I learned to become a storyteller as well, because uh, you know, when you're talking about asking about Walt Disney, he'd mm-hmm. say. He'd say, Walt Disney was a great man. Walt Disney was a genius. If you were his friend, he was a warm personal friend. If you crossed him, he was a mean son of a bitch. <laughs> he'd, he'd go after you. <laughs> and, you know, and he goes, he was all those things at once. And like, okay, you know, that, that, that's fair. <laughs> you know, you know. Uh, but um he, you know, he was he he was he was fun that way. He also was um, his second wife was the daughter of Chico Marx, hmm. so so he's married into the Marx Brothers. <laughs> you know, and, and when he first when I first came out from from New York and they were in L.A., uh, uh, you know, he was um, he was staying with his father in law in his father in law's mansion, while you know waiting for. He says, uh, uh, "I get the feeling that his dad never approved of him. He always thought his his daughter could do better." And everything he'd say, he'd say, say, my husband Jimmy, the commercial artist. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but um, at one point, um, which I asked him, I said, so what were the Marx Brothers like off camera? And he goes, biggest bunch of horse players you ever saw. He <laughs> says, he says, mornings I'd go down to the kitchen, you know, to get a morning coffee, and all and and all of them were all around the kitchen table with the with the charts from Hialeah and Hollywood Park with cigars and stuff, and all all handicapping the races that day, oh. and, you know. And, and he's like, "It's too early for this stuff. <laughs> I, want, I want a cup of coffee." <laughs> Now, was this uh, your first uh, animation job, or uh, um, did you do I, anything my, before that? Yeah, my very first job was at a little industrial company on 19th Street called Teletactics, and and, and it was a film called "Let's Hippity Hop to Nutrition Land." <laughs> okay, so it's on it's YouTube. <laughs> you know, you do your uh, job's a job. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, it's explaining this is a carbohydrate, this is protein, oh. this is a fat, you know, this is kind of mm. thing. I may it's have kind of... seen it, you never know. When did this yeah, come out? Yeah. When yeah, was so it made? Uh, it, it was like a, a, yeah, 75, I think yeah. it was. Probably. It was, yeah. I yeah, was you know, nine years I was... old, so I could have seen it. <laughs> I, mean, I, I was just talking with another Disney animator about um, uh, when Disney used to make these kind of films, and, uh, and they did one with Donald Duck called The Story of Steel. Where Donald Duck explains how steel was made, you know, yeah. and and I said, you know, uh, and that's back when they, yeah, they would roll in the sixteen millimeter projector, you know, everything, yep. and they'd run the, and yep, they'd run the, yep. <laughs> and um, and I was telling my friend, I said, I said, I remembered nothing about the second grade, but I remembered how to make steel. 
because <laughs> Donald Duck showed me how to make steel. So if you had Donald Duck as your teacher, you would have learned everything. <laughs> really well, yeah. <laughs> now, the one you did with Seamus that said uh, is this one, and I haven't seen this either, Protection <laughs> in the Nuclear Age. Yeah. So explain that one. <laughs> I know. It's like Seamus was taking all these weird gigs at the end of his career, like just anything. And and uh, because because he was like a um uh you know um it 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 was like a Reaganite remake of a, of a nineteen fifties movie about how to survive a, an atomic attack. Mm. For some reason, the government wanted this updated and everything. And they're like, okay, you know, and, and 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 we used all these like sort of um, uh, UN sort of gender neutral figures to be the people. Like you didn't really see details on the people; they're just these outlines and everything. And and, and Seamus was would joke about about you know why we don't make them look like real people? This way, the audience doesn't get upset when they fry. <laughs> <laughs> now did your film still have duck and cover or were they finally abandoned that <laughs> yeah yeah I think they, yeah they abandoned duck and cover but it was kind of like the same kind of thing it was just like you know evacuate major city uh major cities and you know all, all this kind of nonsense you know you know you know barricade yourself in your basement with uh with you know eat live live on graham crackers for 500 years and you'll be okay you know and, and it's like you know nobody working everybody worked on it was like oh it's just you know just let's just take their money <laughs> <laughs> so did you work on any others with Seamus I mean that's the only one that's listed it... that was the, that was the main one yeah, yeah 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 I was a little bit on on the the last of the red hot dragons which was like another like little film that he made that, that okay. he made he, he made a connection with um he made a connection with Bruno Bozzetto studio oh yeah and, and uh, you know and they had just done Allegro non troppo and everything and, and and so so they were doing stuff together you know and and uh Seamus would be would, would be on the phone to um would be on the phone to Milan and and, and he go eh, eh, Milano eh, yeah, yeah Ugo eh, yeah it's Seamus yeah, yeah okay oh fuck <laughs> could he speak <laughs> or that's like the only Italian he knew oh, well. <laughs> pizza <laughs> and <Anyway. fungal>. so, <laughs> you know, but uh but yeah, yeah, again, he was a, he was a he was a great character, and and yeah, he knew so many wonderful people. I mean, uh, he, he, you know, I met Bill Titler's daughter working for him, and um, and Chris Ishi, who was a background artist at Disney's uh, again during the strike and everything. Also, he was a he was a striker at you know, time and moved back east. So there was a certain cadre of artists who who drifted back east, you know, during the you know basically d during the Mad Men era to get in on, on all the commercial work that was happening around uh, around town. Didn't um, if memory serves, since I wrote the Total Television book, didn't Chris Ishii work for Total Television for a time? I think, I think so. Yeah, yeah. 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 I should look yeah. at my own book. <laughs> but yeah. anyway, yeah. and yeah. I, if if memory serves, I was going to actually interview him. It was yeah. Joe Harris who put me in contact, and they passed away before I could get in touch uh, with him. I'm like, yeah. I know. so I, that's I, why I, his name always triggers yeah. a memory is one I missed. So if you, if, if you remember Woody Allen's uh, Annie Hall. Uh, he did, he did the animation, the Snow White animation in that. Oh, was, okay. Right, right. The, the, yeah, that was Chris's studio stuff. Okay. So, you know, he used other freelancers as well because he was primarily known as a background artist and stuff. Right. But he put together a nice little group to animate that. And the next one I have on here uh, is you mentioned earlier Richard Williams. So, uh, how how did that transition happen? Yeah from Seamus. oh yeah yeah well, well i mean i started on um well seamus was one of the original production managers on on the movie raggedy ann and andy hmm. and, and 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 it was um uh, uh you know and, and there was a uh, there was a lead assistant on it named dan haskett who i knew from high school and dan and i were friends and uh, dan's an excellent artist and all and 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 you know and dan you know encouraged them to hire me and everything for for the for the uh for the williams project Seamus by then had quit you know you know and uh you know, uh, you know like because i think the pro the issue was that when Seamus was running it they were running they were gonna do the film as like a low budget upa style production like a very simple design and then dick came in and had all these wild ideas of like expanding the quality and making all the super <laughs> animation you know you know dick, dick dick's famous motto was uh, he would say life's on ones <laughs> you know <laughs> 
meaning single frames. It, yeah. it, you know, most animation is filmed uh, uh, twice. It's almost uh, it's like two twenty fourths of a second. Mm -hmm. Well, well, well. Um, very rapid animation on once it was like one twenty fourth of a second. Mm -hmm. You know, so 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 Dick always wanted as much um, uh, drawing and quality in it as possible and everything. Mm -hmm. and so he and Seamus clashed over that originally, and and so Seamus wound up leaving the project, even though he still got a screen credit on, uh, you know, on it. Yeah. But but I was like, I started like a, you know as a, as a painter and then moved up through in betweening, and got a chance to and again too the the amazing thing about Dick's projects at that time was that dick um loved and respected the old character animators of the 1940s mm -hmm. and so he was giving jobs to all these amazing artists who had no um you know outlet otherwise mm -hmm. and so so you know there's jerry chinicky who who you know was the first animator of yosemite sam and then there's art babbitt who created goofy and you mm -hmm. know and <laughs> you know the wicked queen you know and then as all these strong artists you know and and and, and it's interesting because this is when i first saw the generational gap where where it's like all the in-betweeners like all the entry-level positions were all at like around 1920 21 you know years of age and all the animators were in their 60s <laughs> and there was nobody in the middle you know like it was very few you know there's yeah. a couple like you know ralph Bakshi, don bluth like that you know there's a couple of people in the middle yeah. um but but it was generally that it was during that um, uh, retrenchment of Hollywood, you know, the generational shift, you know, mm -hmm. and 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 not to drop a name, but I was talking to Steven Spielberg about this, and uh, <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, yeah, you know, and 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 he said he said yeah he says well, yeah when I was doing Night Gallery you know 1969 uh, he, he, you know everybody on my crew were in their sixties. Yeah, he's just like you know, he's like in his twenties, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like was, was like, of course, he's oh. directing Joan Crawford in the first one, which is you know a lot older than her, him, yeah, you exactly. know. And she, yeah, yeah. The, the story I know is that you know uh, she at first didn't like him. She said, oh, "Who's this teenager?" <laughs> which he was a little <laughs> older than that, directing me. But then uh, she found out he knew what he was doing, and she was very protective over him. That's what I've heard. Oh, yeah. But, you know, so yeah. That's <laughs> Yeah, but but it is that but but there was that great shift, you know. You suddenly mm -hmm. saw, you know, and, and it's funny because, it, it, you know, really from the late fifties into the sixties, hard hard quality character animation was like sort of on the outs. Like nobody mm -hmm. wanted that stuff. They wanted the very graphic, you know, the very you know Captain Crunch, you know, very simple <laughs> type stuff. Well, do you think uh, the um, people in the I'm sorry to interrupt the people in like that middle age range were they working in like more like the for tv commercials and things like that rather than yeah. the feature yeah. animation or the shorts or anything else or even saturday morning type stuff yeah yeah or, uh -huh. or, or, or you know or they were even you know dissuaded from getting into animation you know mm -hmm. but i mean i remember uh, again there's a book that i'm working on right now about that time period about about how many older folks would you know with the, when you first meet people they go animation that business is dying don't waste your time <laughs> You know, just something else you, do. you know, it, it's not going anywhere. You know, <laughs> and that was the attitude in those days. You know, uh, um, George Bakes, who was um, who worked for, for, with Bill Teitler a lot when Teitler had his New York commercial studio, was talking about how uh, they would get a commercial for like Doxy clam chowder, mm -hmm. and, and 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 all the client wanted was was uh, uh, the product shot. You know, the can of clam chowder. And a, and and a school of little fish swim by, so all you would want is basically like one drawing of a school of fish with a two drawing cycle of little fins, and you just move it by. You know that that's all you want. That's all they wanted. Mm. And Tyler took it and did and did like the Persian dance in Fantasia. You know, he did this beautiful <laughs> fish animation, it wow. it and gorgeous, and they hated it. Mm. And, you know, because it didn't look modern it looked like it looked like old-fashioned stuff mm. you know? i mean even uh, even uh ward, ward kimball at that time uh, uh you, you know when everything was in the upa style everything was in the modern graphic style uh ward used to joke about uh bambi and and pinocchio as being the campbell soup kids <laughs> <laughs> it's all around everything round and rosy cheeks and all that kind of stuff and that was considered old hat mm -hmm. <laughs> so really like my generation kind of brought that back in the late eighties and nineties, you know, suddenly like we brought back real character animation, again, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I mean, it's a thing that I'm always trying to encourage my students about 
that um, that don't get locked into a style because the times will change, and then you'll be stuck. It, 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 you know, you know, like the counter to that tight love, you know, uh, story was uh, I was at DreamWorks and we were working on the Prince of Egypt, and that's like real hardcore character and a very full, very humanistic character image. And this old animator came in. He was a very proud old man, you know, and we worked on a lot of stuff together. And, um, you know, he was white haired, which I wasn't yet, but uh, <laughs> at that time. And anyway, his portfolio all had all stuff from the 60s. So it was all that Captain Crunch and Quisp and Quake and, uh, <laughs> you know, you know all, all that, you know, you know, Snap, Crackle and Pop. And uh, uh, it was all in that style. And um, it's beautiful, but it wasn't our style. You know, and 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 he was rejected, and I felt so bad for him. You know, I, I felt terrible, but it's like, you know, it's the times changed. You know, so I mean, right now we're in an age where things are a little graphic, more graphic now than they were maybe like ten years ago. You know, they go into the Samurai Jack and yeah. things like BoJack Horseman and stuff like that. Like they like stuff a little more, a little more flat. But uh, you know, it could shift back again. Who knows? Right. It, you know, so. Um, let's see. So I guess I could ask about more people. So you also work with, uh, Eric Goldberg and Art mm -hmm. Babbitt, you mentioned John Canemaker, uh, during that time. What, what yeah. were, when you worked with these various people, did you actually have, have the ability to like actually be friends with them? I don't know how oh, yeah. animation studios always worked. I mean, especially later on, if everybody is like kind of in their own world and they don't really interact much or if there's like a camaraderie because you hear that more about like older studios you know in the termite terrace days but yeah. when you get later on it's like I, it doesn't sound like it as much but yeah. anyway what's yeah. your memory? i mean i i, I mean uh, you know me and eric and and john and everything we're, we're of that generation where we're, we idolize those guys and stuff and we wanted to be like them <laughs> you, know, like, you know you know we wanted to be like a termite terrorist thing so you know it's a very small community and we all know each other mm -hmm. so it's kind of like stuntmen you know like stuntmen <laughs> all get together and they hang out and they talk about oh yeah yeah come on it was great you should see him fall off a horse oh mm -hmm. my God. like and and animators are the same way they'd all sit around and they'd all tell war stories to one another you know <laughs> you know carl bell was uh uh, who worked for Richard Williams, and, and I worked with him, uh, he was telling me about working on Beanie and Cecil for Bob Clampett. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and he would say that, like, a, a, you know, about how crazy Clampett was, where he says sometimes you'd go in, this, in, in his office, uh, uh, you know, to ask a question or, or, or get or get notes on your scene, and Clampett would put on a Cecil puppet and would make you talk to the puppet. <laughs> <laughs> she'd, say, she'd say, well, Carl, I think you should hold an extra eight frames on the last pose and then cut to the long shot, you know? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, love, I love stuff like that. <laughs> you know, that's great. Because you, know? you realize that they're all, you know, a, 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 like a, a thing that's a little different now than it was back then was that in that time period, and you know from like doing the, uh, you did the, the Patty Frailing story and all, mm -hmm. all the studios were run by uh, were owned by people who were were produce uh, were artists like they're all run by people right. who made animation you yeah. know bill and, uh, you know hannah barbera made animation and 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 frizz frailing and you know steve was and and lou scheimer and stuff they all made it uh, now it's all businessmen it's all yeah. it's all suits you, you know i mean it's like there's like two studios like ken duncan's and and dal van Sutter's renegade and that in hollywood that like that are actually run by animators you know you know but uh, it's 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 increasingly rare yeah you know, because back then uh you know see that's the other thing too is like people um uh, you know, younger people would ask me like, well, you know, back then, like, didn't didn't like somebody like uh, um, Jimmy Stewart or, uh, or Humphrey Bogart want to do a cartoon voice? And I said, no, <laughs> they, <laughs> cartoons were looked down on as like, you know, as, you know, bottom base basement level junk, you know, like that, you know, if you ever if you ever uh, go to the Warner Brothers lot. The animation studio was about as far away from the center of the studio as you could get. It was practically mm -hmm. up against the back wall by the by the 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 drainage, uh, you know, uh, you know the LA River, you know, kind of a thing in the back there. It's like, you know, nobody in there, you know, if you, uh, I think uh, it was, um, oh my goodness, the. The, the girl who's the voice of oh jody belson who was the voice of ariel and little mermaid 
right. was saying that when she got the job to do the voice uh, of Ariel, uh, her other her other Broadway friends called her up with consolation. Like, <laughs> That's too bad. Doing cartoons. Oh man. Uh, uh. Nowadays, <laughs> it, nowadays it'd get like Taylor Swift to do it, you know, or something, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, um, yeah, it amazes me because you know we're you know somebody was talking about who was the first celebrity voices and probably was like some of those 40s compilation films where they got Dinah Shore and you know different people to narrate things and stuff like that but you know and then I jokingly said but you know some people can't always tell that I was joking but it's true (laughs) I was saying maybe Walt Disney is the first celebrity voice because you know he did become a celebrity but I think he did Mickey out of convenience more than anything else yeah 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 he he got tired of telling people how to do it you know you know you know there's the famous story about in Tom and Jerry uh uh, Tom's famous laugh you know the famous Mm -hmm. like you know, like you know, he, he somebody hit him on the foot or something, and that big oh, yeah. laugh, that big roaring scream would come out. Yeah, that's that's uh, was, I believe that's Bill Hanna. Yeah, I've heard it's Bill Hanna. <laughs> yeah, 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 because I'd because, love to have that uh, that filmed when he did it. You know, it's like, yeah. all right, take one, because apparently he they ran through a bunch of actors, the, yeah. you, you know, and and Bill kept going, no, not like that, like this, ah. Yeah. No, not like that, like this. Ah! And finally, Joe said, Bill, why don't you do it? Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that story many times over the years. I think it was like, you know, like Melinda's, how he got the job doing Snoopy's oh, voice, yeah. or yeah. Uh, is just because nobody else would do it the way he, he wanted oh, yeah. it done. And so he did it himself. You know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so. yeah. I used to hang out with Bill Melendez too, because because Bill was also a president of, uh, of the guild, uh, you know, mm-hmm. when I was president, when I was guild president. And, and and so we would get together and talk like you know you know talk shop or something and uh, uh i never worked for bill but but we just hung out a lot and mm-hmm. and again too he was, he, was a, he was a great animator you know he was a great animator in his own right before he was running a studio and he was a striker he was at the 41 strike yep. and and um uh, he he was funny too because um one of the things i noticed when i'd interviewed those guys about the strike was that I said the the people who who crossed the picket line and defied the strike, uh, when you talk to them, wouldn't look you in the eye, mm-hmm. and and the strikers would look right at you. <laughs> you know, so, so so you talk to Bill, uh, you know, like Bill would go, "Yeah, we shut him down. We drove Walt crazy." <laughs> <laughs> You know, and we're very casual about it, you know, and the people who crossed were like, well, you weren't there at the time. It's a, it was a bad time. And it's just, you know, yeah. <laughs> so I thought like, well, I want to be like Melendez, you know, I, want, I don't want to have to, you know, make excuses my old age. You know, not, not just... <laughs> but, but one other thing was fun about Bill that I loved him was um, Bill was from the Mad Men era and everything. I mean, he had done his best work, you know, the, the work he's known for in the 60s, you know. Right. And, and and he worked with a lot of agency people and stuff. And so every time we would have lunch, lunch to Bill was three vodka martinis. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Bill, I can't get screwed up. I got to go back to work, you know. And he's like, bang, bang. Yep. <laughs> Well, that's what I discovered when I was interviewing the people for the Total Television book, Buck Biggers yeah. and uh, Chet Stover and those guys. They they were talking about martini lunches, and they're just talking about it as something normal. And Mad Men was on the air at that time, and I said it's Mad Men, and he it just dawned on him when I was talking. Oh yeah, I guess yeah. it was, you know. Yeah. But he lived it, so he didn't think it was anything odd or out of the ordinary. And yeah. you know, I even commented, it's like you know, nowadays you'd probably be fired for being an alcoholic. Or oh yeah. yeah, yeah, you yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I actually had a chance to to talk to Matthew Weiner about it too, and because he's a USC pro, and, and and by saying that when I saw that, how right you got it and everything, because I I was like the tail end of Mad Men, like when I was doing co- work at commercial studios in New York, and Xander's was on 40th and Madison Avenue, so we were in the Young and Rubicon building, you know, mm-hmm. so so like you know I would walk in the elevator and it'd be like nine guys in gray suits and stuff, all look <laughs> identical, you know, and I'm like in my sloppy army jacket and stuff because I'm the freelance artist you know but uh but was but he caught that he caught that really well you know and and, uh uh i lost my i lost my earlier thought it'll it'll come to me in a in a minute but uh what i found uh, oh oh i remember i remember yeah carl bell had another story about uh he was working at chuck jones on um when walt kelly was there 
and they were doing the the uh, uh, they were going to do the pogo special, mm-hmm. and, and and Kelly was a tippler. I mean, Kelly was like a he would show up in the morning and like, is there a bar around here? <laughs> I need a hit to wake up. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I hope the family's not. I, I don't want to get. I, I mean, I love Selby and everybody. They're all wonderful people. But but anyway, um, uh, allegedly, we'll do that. Allegedly, yeah, allegedly, yeah, allegedly. But uh, this saying. is real Hollywood history, folks. Yes, this yes. is real. <laughs> but but you know what was funny was uh, Carl was saying. He said, um, the production manager Marlene Robinson, uh, uh, you know, uh, got the staff together and said, when working with with Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly likes to have a drink at lunch. So when you come back to the studio after lunch, and and, and and Chuck's office was on Vine and Sunset. So it was like right in the center of Hollywood. And there was actually there was actually a bar like on, on at the penthouse. Mm. I, think was, I think it was called the Swan Room or something like that. But uh, but really not it's a shame it's not there anymore. It's a perfect place for, for a hangout. But um but uh, Marlene said, okay, uh, when you come back from lunch. Uh, uh, when you pass by Mr. Kelly's room, don't disturb him. No matter what you see, you leave him alone because he's Walt <laughs> Kelly and you're not. So just leave him alone. I'm like, and then Carl was like, right, after that, I got to look now. <laughs> I got to see. <laughs> so he said. So he said he he came back to the he came back to the uh, from lunch and and he walks walk into the hallway and he and he passed by the door and, and he peeked in mm-hmm. and he says Walt Kelly is like uh, by his desk laying face down in a puddle of drool like <laughs> completely unconscious wow and, he, and he's like is that guy dead is he all right and he's like no he's fine don't worry about it you know <laughs> and then after a while he would come to and he'd get up and he'd start <laughs> inking his strip you know hmm. and um ben washam who was another animator who who worked uh, worked there said that kelly could be so drunk that if he stood up he'd fall down but but he'd he'd hand ink his strip so like he he says his hand was like a rock, the rest of him was like, you know, like Kid Shaleen and Capaloo, you know, like Lee oh, Marvin, wow. you know, you know, but he but the, the hand was like, wow, like perfect, interesting. <laughs> so all, all his concentration was in his hand. So wow. <laughs> see i will go to let's see you worked at hannah barbera for a bit so um but the only thing listed is super friends which is not a problem because i watched it but is that the only thing you worked on there or is that the only thing that they (laughs) mentioned (laughs) yeah there's a bunch of stuff um uh i I did uh what i did the godzilla power hour Mm -hmm. and and jana the jungle and uh, and yogi's laugh olympics Mm-hmm. And uh, some Scooby Doo, some Scooby Doo cleanup, and 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 Super Friends. For Scooby's um, Laugh Olympics. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of those. Yeah, there's always another one. Yeah, you know, there's always that thing. Uh, there's a bunch of those stuff, and and, and there's a lot of shows. You know, I mean, that time period, like 1978, like that. Um, H and B uh, again too. Bill and Joe gave jobs to all the. Um, all the old animators, like all these old right. animators, you know? and you walk around the studio, and it's like a, a it's like a, a Noah's Ark of of classic animators, you know. This is his lifeboat. You walk around and go, "That's Dave Tendler, who who worked on 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 Popeyes and Betty Boops, and is you know you know Kaz Anzalotti, who was Ralph Bakshi's you know assistant director, and 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 there's Ken Muse, who was like one of the great you know who animated Jerry dancing with Gene Kelly and Anchors Away, you know." So there's all these amazing people. And the my big coup when I was at H and B was that I got in the poker game. <laughs> which is like every lunch, a whole bunch of animators would sit around and 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 play the and play poker. <laughs> you know, you know, and, and uh and it was all these heavy Vegas games, you know, like it was always like a seven card around the world baseball, you know, jacks <laughs> one eye jacks are better. So, I don't know. I'm just a kid, but um, <laughs> but there's these guys. It's like you know Nick Nichols, who was a directing animator at Disney, and you know, and then it was, I, oh, he wasn't at the time, but I mean, they're they're all working for 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 uh, for Bill and Joe, and um, it was interesting because um, uh, Bill was uh, they divided up their their duties. You know, uh, Bill was um, uh, very much involved in production. And making sure production went through, and Joe was involved in um, developing new shows and and pitching new new series and publicity, and they kept their realms, you know, you know, separate. 
and everything. So you very rarely saw the two of them together. They were always doing their 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 stuff on their own, you know. And 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 um, they're very nice. And you know, it's interesting too because like some of the old animators, particularly like the elderly MGM guys and stuff, would uh, uh, during the uh, afternoon break would hobble up to this little market. And, and and buy a pint of bourbon <laughs> to like, <laughs> like sit, sit, sit at the desk, and and and, um, and, and uh, they said Joe Barbera uh, spoke to the manager of the um, uh, 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 of the market and said, "Keep a running tab, and then give it to me at the end of the month, and I'll pay it." So oh, nice. <laughs> it was nice. This is very very nice and very nice person, you know. And and you know, one time, um, oh, um, one time. Um, I was with uh, this other assistant uh, it was an older lady and she knew all these guys and stuff. And um, we would drop off freelance to some, some freelance artists who um, uh, were too frail to come into work, you know, but they still want to keep working. And there was this guy named Hicks Loki and, and Hicks Loki animated on Fantasia. Like he animated uh, the crocodile and the elephant in the dance of the hours. Oh wow! Stuff. So he was a mm-hmm. magnificent animator, you, you know. Mm-hmm. But when I knew him, he was elderly. He looked like an Appalachian apple doll or something. He was like really, very really little old man, you know. Oh, like this. And and, um, and 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 but he was a brilliant animator when he was young. So um, we were doing Godzilla. So um, so he would, uh, you know, we drive up to his house, and this little elderly guy would would hobble out. I would some with a package, and he goes, "I got forty feet here of uh, Godzilla fighting the smog monster, or kelp monster, or some kind of bullshit. I don't know what it is." Wow! <laughs> and it was all good. It was all yeah, good yeah. stuff. Mm-hmm. Was, yeah. Did you encounter Tex Avery there, or is the uh, were uh, you? Yeah, I met him. I met him once. Yeah, okay. yeah. I didn't really get a. I didn't really get a good chance to talk with him okay. and everything to the you, you know but um but he was there and, and yeah. I, I do remember that he was like in a in a different department you know uh, and um i i got to know michael law you know mm-hmm. who's another um um a- avery animator and stuff right. and uh you know uh, all, all very nice people and, and stuff you, you know because i know that like you know we all like spoke the same language which is animation you know mm-hmm. so it's like <laughs> That shows you went on to filmation for a bit, and uh, mm-hmm. you did those uh, lo- those weekday versions of He Man and Fat Albert or whatever, um, mm-hmm. among other things. I mean, uh, oh, yeah. I guess you were friends with Mike Kazala and a few other people like yeah. that. Yep. Yeah, okay. Because no, yeah. I'm yeah. trying to think who I know that worked there at that point, and I've asked yeah. him many questions. Um, it, 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 you know, it's funny too is that you know that's another place too that you know Lou hired a lot of um, old animators. You know, a lot of people right. who had worked on a bunch of stuff. You, you know, and and, uh, and done a whole bunch of things. And uh, and I remember like I eventually became a director there, and and and, and it was a little controversial because there was like a lot of older guys who were always hoping for a chance and all. And and so sometimes I get a little you know a dig or animosity from some of the older folks. But I remember this one old animator came up to me, uh, you know, giving him s- some scenes. And I knew that he was very infirm. He was a very frail guy. And um, so I'd give him easy footage and everything. And and he recognized that. And he once said, come on, Tom, I was animating when you were in a spot in your old man's pants. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, thank you. Okay. And he, said, he said, did you ever see Make My Music? I go, yeah, it's a fantastic film. He goes, remember Willie the Whale? And I go, yes, I love that sequence. I cried at the end. It was so beautiful. He goes, he goes, when when Willie the Whale gets hit with the harpoon shot from the boat, I animated the cable. <laughs> it was a wow. great cable. That was a really killer cable, I'm telling you. Killer cable. <laughs> so I'm your man if you need good cable animation. Come on, give me some scenes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know the the crazy thing about the He-Man show was that at the time we were doing it, the craze for for He-Man was just getting started. 
Right. And and um, I, I don't think we knew what a big deal it would be. It, it, you know, like I was just happy to be working because, uh, you, you know, because we had a strike and there was a, re uh, a recession right. and, and there wasn't a lot of work in town. And, you know, you, you know, um, I think Don Bluth was laying off and Disney's was wrapping up um, uh, Black Cauldron. So there wasn't a lot happening. And so I was very happy to be working on this show. And I remember like saying to the my first day saying to the guy next to me, name of the show is really he-man right that's like a temp title like the the real name would be like karnak or you know, <laughs> you know something like that and he goes no it's really he-man yeah and then it came out it's like a monster hit yeah, you know? yeah i mean 30 years later i'm still getting invited to fan conventions mm -hmm. you know like people in their 40s and stuff it's yeah. he-man he-man and Shira. I mean, I thought it was a goofy name too. I was already a teenager by that point, but I watched it enough. And the but the thing that was impressive to me, just because it seemed like animation was by yeah, that point, yeah. uh, is that you turned out sixty five episodes, you know, and probably more later. But I mean, initial run was sixty five episodes, which oh, yeah. you know, I know like Saturday morning by that point you're down to like thirteen. You know, it's like yeah. so. Oh, this yeah. is yeah. you know many times more. You you know, you know it was, it was an five times more you know <laughs> it, it was an amazing deal you know it, you know when that was happening but uh mm -hmm. it was a huge boom at that at that point all those kind of shows and then oh, yeah. and it's funny you know because then when i was when i went to england to work on who framed roger rabbit uh, um i had already started to teach a little bit at night so i was doing some like night night classes at some schools and and and, and i remember like one of my early students was a, a ucla grad named david silverman Mm -hmm. and, and you know and, and uh we we're both close friends with charles solomon the the animation historian and um and i remember like i was packing my bags to go to england and uh and and david had been working for this company called laser media which did like laser light shows on the side of buildings <laughs> and, stuff. and he says yeah i got this new job um he says you know you know matt graining the guy who does uh, uh um uh, life in hell in the la weekly the comic strip and i go yeah well he's doing interstitials in the tracy ellman show mm -hmm. and, and and they're going to be about this family and a dysfunctional family is going to be very funny and i go well david what's the name he goes the simpsons and i go well david that doesn't sound funny it, <laughs> it's, it's just a name you know the, the wellingtons you know the andersons and he goes it's gonna be very funny i go david get a real job you know, that's <laughs> like Captain Caveman and the Teen Angels, you know, something. <laughs> okay, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. <laughs> Who knew? Is he still at the Simpsons now? Because I mean, yeah, it's still yeah. on. <laughs> he's a senior director there, you know. Okay. I mean, the Simpsons have been going for so long. Students of mine are like planning, who started working on it, are planning their retirement now. And I'm just, like, yeah. oh. you know, they just got approved for the 34th to 35th season. Yeah. I guess it'll keep yeah. going unless one of the major voices dies. That's the only thing I can think yeah. of, you know, because yeah. Yeah. I used to think, oh, they can't go past 20 years. Oh, they can't go past 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they'll stop when they make the feature film. You know, they've got yeah. done all that. So I don't know. It's like, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe when James L. Brooks retires or something, because yeah. I mean, the the key to the Simpsons was the was the writing, you know, yeah. it's just like keeping the, the quality of that writing so good. And mm -hmm. you know, it's so strong and everything. Mm -hmm. you know? Like who had the Flintstones, you know, by the time they got the Gadzooks, you know. <laughs> oh Gazoo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Gazoo. You know, you're just like, what the hell is this weird show? Like <laughs> Well, more power to the Simpsons, but, you know, unfortunately, I think, you know, it's best years have passed a long time ago. Now, some may argue with me on that and I go, OK, fine, you know, but, you know, it's like, you know, I think it's kind of like, you know, I mentioned Mad Magazine. It kind of is like where you came in on, you know, if you yeah. came in at the beginning, yeah. you know, you're going to like this certain period. If you came in 20 okay. years into it, you're going to like that certain period. <laughs> you yeah, know, so, exactly. you know. Yeah. Yeah. I just have to respect that for anybody who's a fan nowadays and not, you know, <laughs> diss them because obviously it's still on. So there's yeah. somebody watching it. I just don't <laughs> tend to. <laughs> um, going back to your career again, you yeah. this is your life. No, um, so uh, after Filmation, you got the job at Disney and you were at Disney doing during like, like the best time since 
<laughs> well, oh, yeah. you know oh, now oh, um so oh, yeah. you know obviously i'll just read it out for people who don't know you worked on little yeah. mermaid beauty and the beast aladdin lion king pocahontas fantasia 2000 dinosaur well dinosaur may not be one of the yeah. top ones yeah. but you know all oh, those yeah. other ones are like you know considered like the big animation renaissance and everything oh, yeah. like that yeah. The question is, did you know that at the time, or was it just like, <laughs> oh, you know, it's like I'm getting a job at Disney, and you know, maybe they'll do something better than you know, Black Cauldron. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. oh yeah, oh, oh yeah. Well, that's it. That's it. You, you know, I mean, it's it's funny because um, uh, um, you know, when you look at Disney's from the outside, they're like, oh, they're just turning out these terrific movies one after another, and it's like you know, they they just know how to do it. On the inside, we're like, this can't last much longer. <laughs> it's like. What the hell are we gonna do now? It's like you know, you yeah. say, okay, so, so I mean, uh, Roger Rabbit was like a gigantic hit, right. but then we said, well, that's Bob Zemeckis and Steven Spielberg's influence, you know, because like, because like Zemeckis had had only hits up to that point, you know, Romancing the Stone and and uh, Back to the Future, and everything he did was like gigantic and everything. So, right. so Roger Rabbit was gigantic, and Jessica was like very sexy, and it wasn't the kind of thing that we do in a Disney cartoon and all. So we started Mermaid, and we're like, oh, I don't know, is it going to be good? I, I, I hope it is. It's going to be good. And then Mermaid's a gigantic hit, and then like Beauty and the Beast was like, well, I don't know, you know, Belle isn't as likable as Ariel was, and 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 and, and you know, the, we had a lot of story problems with. It. Then that was a gigantic hit, and then we go Aladdin. Well, Aladdin's more of a of a, of a farce than the other films, and the love story was, I don't know if it'll have the same. A P, and then that's a gigantic hit, and, you know, and and it was just funny that that, that we just kept hitting these things you know you know and and um uh you know and and not only the conflict you know the influx of like fant great art artists animators but the musicians as well you know like all the different well you know uh howard ashman and and uh and alan menken you know and then stephen schwartz afterwards and all uh, you know and and you really saw that like how um disney animation became a, a lifeboat for the american musical because uh, and you know people forget this too that in in the in the uh, in the late eighties, uh, uh, Broadway was like kind of dead in the water. Also, the the only thing that was happening on Broadway were British imports. You know, Le Miserable, Phantom of the Opera, Cats, you, you know, Miss Saigon. Those were all British. They're all yeah. the, the, there were hits on the West End first, and then they came over here. The only thing we had going was Little Shop of Horrors. Right. So like like that was the big hit. You, yeah. You know, that, and then and, you and didn't all, have all, we didn't have all hits because like Disney did the live action Newsies, the original one, which yeah. has gained traction in recent times. And they did a remake. But, you know, the original one was Flopperoo. <laughs> it's oh, yeah. like, yeah, you know, yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I remember the studio was like, you, you know, the big trend now is going to be, you know, movie musicals, you know, and it's like, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's like you can predict this, but like, no. <laughs> now you were on all these big movies all at the same time um was it the same anime animators during that or did people come uh, and go and like were you hired to do a set of pictures or just one at a time uh, how um, did that work um you kind of did it one at a time and stuff and, and um i mean we we're on staff and everything and i mean you know i mean all of us want to be you know frank and ollie you know frank Thomas, right. ollie Johnson. You, you know I, I mean i remember when at frank's memorial I was sitting around talking with my contemporaries and saying, you know, Frank was like the poster boy for Disney Animator, which is you, Frank and Ollie got out of Stanford, went right into Disney's, spent 46 years being the most fantastic artist possible, retired rich and wrote books. And I'm like, you know, sign me up. <laughs> You're like, I want to do that, you know. But the industry changed. Like, it wasn't the right. kind of, you know, I mean, the great thing was Roy Disney was like a, a wonderful throwback to, to, you know you know here's a billionaire you, you, you know i mean you know going i don't want to get into politics but going through the era of trump it's like it's like i've i know i've known billionaires you know it's like roy disney was a billionaire you know jeffrey katzenberg's a billionaire you know spielberg and you know and and they don't have solid gold toilets you know <laughs> <laughs> you know you know roy was a very modest guy you yeah. know and and he came up with you know even though he was born wealthy i mean you know he was a legacy baby um, he he earned his stripes. I mean, he he was an editor on Dragnet, uh, it, you know, and and he produced uh, uh, the the real life adventures, and he'd done a lot of studio work before being an executive. So he he knew the process, and he would really, and he really felt like like you couldn't argue 
the bottom line with him because money wasn't as important as the reputation of the Disney studio. Like he really was a safeguard of the reputation, you know, and, and, you know, he, he chain smoke like his uncle and stuff, you know, I and didn't know that, but I oh, never yeah. thought about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's like, well, he chain smoked, and, you know, I think he, he quit in like the last 10 years of his life, but, mm -hmm. but I remember um, he, he, he was very soft spoken, you know, and, and, but, but effective. He would say, people ask me if I care, I got to care. My name's on the damn door. <laughs> <laughs> You yeah. know, I should I should know this, and you might know this. I mean, but I don't. Um, did Roy Disney Senior did he smoke? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't know. Okay, yeah. you know, you because yeah. you never saw him, but it didn't mean they didn't. You know, it's yeah. like you know. Yeah. So I was just. And, and was fascinating about, find that out. <laughs> what was fascinating about Roy Junior was that like he looked alarmingly like his uncle. He, yeah. he looked yeah. so much like his uncle, and, and and you know he had a little mustache, yeah. you know, and, and a cigarette, and, and he started he started shaving his mustache at one point. I think he got tired of people, you know, yeah. comment that you look like your uncle. Yeah, yeah you know. I think the first time I saw him was it was a newspaper article like early eighties. And yeah. it's before the big renaissance, but I mean, it's like, yeah. here's Walt Disney's nephew, and he looks yeah. just like him, you know. <laughs> and he did, and I was like, wow, yeah. I didn't know this, I didn't know who he was, you know. It's like, hmm, you know, and you know, yeah. later yeah. I knew who he was, but at the time, you know, he, he hadn't made a name for himself publicly, maybe yeah. within the Disney studio yeah. he had by that point, but you know, yeah. I didn't and, know he was. <laughs> and it's and it's funny you know because like one time um I, 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 you know i leave the, i left the studio a lot to to have lunch with a with a friend in town from san francisco and and, and we were at this little french restaurant in, in toluca lake which is like a nearby neighborhood mm -hmm. and um after the lunch uh you, you know roy roy lived in the toluca lake area mm -hmm. um uh, after lunch i stopped in this small market to, to get a bottle of water or something from my desk and as I was coming out of the uh, out of the market, I felt his hand clap me on the back, and he's like, "Hey, Tom, how are you?" You know, and I turned around, and it's Roy, and it's like, "Oh, hey, Roy, how you doing?" And he's like, yeah, I was just getting picking up a few things, mm -hmm. and I noticed that for lunch he bought himself a dollar seventy five ham and cheese sandwich, in the in, in the triangular wrapping that you get in a catering truck, you know, like the like the cheapest sandwich possible, you know, and I go, "Here's a." billionaire yeah. <laughs> you know? this guy was probably ra raised on roast squab flambeau yeah. or something like that duck l'orange or something and this is his like idea of a, an enjoyable lunch is to get one of yeah. these cheap ass you know ham and well, cheese I have a similar story, is, and this was told me when I used to work at Channel 44 in San Francisco. It was a person mm -hmm. I worked with. She went on some European vacation or something like that. And it was Diane Disney and Roy, uh, uh, not oh, yeah. Roy, uh, Ron Miller. And oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, th she was eating out at fancy European restaurants every night, French restaurants, Italian restaurants. They were brown bagging it, you know? Yeah. And it's like, well, that's how the rich stay rich. They don't spend their money. <laughs> you know, yeah. So yeah, there we go. True. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you, know, you know, it's like this, you know, there are people like they're like they're so unbelievably wealthy it's like i don't need to flaunt it you know like i don't i don't need a, a lamborghini and you know yeah. and whatever and uh, and you know uh, whatever uh, accoutrements like that you know that mm -hmm. then, then you don't to pretend to be you know prosperous and stuff you know yeah. but yeah what are you gonna do <laughs> um now when you left disney was it because you know there's like a little upheaval and the company you went to was part of the result of that is dreamworks was that why you left because you wanted to kind of stick with katzenberg and stuff like that or is it just well, yeah i mean I like, yeah, yeah, yeah i like working with jeffrey you, you okay. know and, and, and uh, um and, and and yeah, when when DreamWorks set up and stuff, it created that split. And actually, kind of reminded me of of a story about Grim Natwick. And and, and that was uh, I remember one time uh, being with a bunch of young filmmakers, and Grim was being interviewed, and 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 uh, and, and the guy said, uh, you know, you know, uh, you quit right after Snow White. So like when Snow White was, you know booming out all over and being like the most the story in animation you quit to go back to fleischer's mm -hmm. and he's like why did you do that were you rejecting the kind of rigidifying stylistic uh, tendencies of the disney studio and you preferred the more loose urban gestalt of the fleischer studio <laughs> or something and graham goes no you offered me more money 
And so I'm the same. I'm the same way with DreamWorks. It's just okay. like, they oh, offered me more money. They yeah. offered me more money. I was okay. like, what <laughs> you know, and, and it's the kind of thing where, you know, a long time ago, um, some great advice I got was they said, try to run your career so that you don't have regrets, mm-hmm. you know, or as few as possible. You can't get rid of them yeah. all, you know. But but I I thought of, about it for a long time, and I thought if I don't take this chance, it's gonna bug me. Yeah. You know, like when I'm an old man, I was going to go. Ah. So I thought I'll go with the change. I'll try. Yeah. It. So. And again, you worked on the ones that I like the most. You know, Prince yeah. of Egypt was good. I liked Ants. I liked Spirit. Uh, Shrek, you it even worked at the beginnings of that. It said on yeah. your bio. And I go, well, I liked all those movies. Yeah. yeah so, yeah, you know, yeah, I don't yeah. know if that was intentional. You just happened to work on all the big oh, yeah. stuff at all these yeah. studios. So. Well, they're, all, they're all fun. Yeah. 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 They're, they're all fun. Yeah, you know, and, and the, the um, um, sh- you know, Shrek was like sort of a, a chaotic project in the beginning because it went through a lot of changes and there was a lot of rewrites and things, you know, and and, and I think it went through like a couple of directors and I, I was head of story for a little while and then uh, the new director came in, didn't like, you know, the direction I was going in. So, you know, I, you know, you know, I had to leave and then I went on to Spirit and then that director, he got replaced. And so, you know, it's it, 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 it really the weekend Shrek opened, if you asked me what it was going to do, like, I don't know. <laughs> you know <laughs> and it was a monster hit they go well yeah. okay we you know it made it then you know i got to work with chris farley and um mm-hmm. chris was a wonderful guy and uh you know he made me feel thin and uh <laughs> <laughs> you know, but he was really nice if you ever saw the film tommy boy mm-hmm. and, and stuff that's chris for real like he's mm-hmm. not acting you know that's 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 really him yeah you know all the time and and he was like a big kid he was just fun you yeah. know and you know and uh you know he 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 had a a lot of great stories and things and and uh, you, you know un, unfortunately you know yeah he, he OD you know you know yeah. so much. and I, later on Osmosis Jones I was talking with um, Chris Rock about that and Chris was really kind of you can see that he was still kind of rattled about yeah I never thought uh, when you think of like which one of us is going to OD like I never thought he'd be the one <laughs> you, you, know, you know I was just like well white suburban kid you know suburban Chicago and stuff and uh, yeah. But, you know, it, it kind of seems inevitable since he idolized John Belushi and stuff like yeah. that. And, you know, he had yeah. similar. <laughs> I'm getting the door shut. Yeah. Oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> As, you know, and so, you know, it's too bad they did follow uh, exactly in Belushi's footsteps. Yeah. But, hey, you know. It's yeah. like... One one story uh, 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 Chris told me that made me laugh was that we were talking about how. Um, again talking about school and stuff and he was like an all catholic school so he had he was regularly beaten up by nuns and stuff and <laughs> and, and, he, and, and, and he said at one point he had a he he was in the middle of a, a of a semicircle of nuns all pointing at him going, going going nobody's laughing with you people are laughing at you and and, and chris goes well at least they're laughing i like them yeah. <laughs> that's what Good i want point, yeah <laughs> <laughs> One thing I never asked, um, it seemed like, but it might just be the tidiness of your resume. Yeah. It yeah. seemed like you would stick with a studio for a period of time and then move on. So you didn't do like studio jumping. You didn't work on this and then jump over here and then jump over here. Or did you? Yeah. No, no, I, well, I mean, even when I was steady in a studio, I'd be freelancing. It, it, okay. It, it, you know stuff so so you know that's a that's another secret about old hollywood too is that you know finding out that even in the golden era guys were picking up from other studios so yeah. warner guys were picking up mgm stuff and things like that yeah. and, and and you know you tried not to rub the nose of the studio in it because you could get in trouble for like working on it for a competitor yeah. you, you know that's what but but you try but like when i was at filmation i was picking up hanna barbera shows and yeah. uh you, you know like um uh challenge of the gobots you know and the, <laughs> young flintstones and things like that it just was easy bunny yeah Yeah. it It seemed like it happened in all art uh industries you know comic books is the same way you know i did the harvey comics companion and Mm -hmm. alfred harvey the owner always put out to everyone you always have a place here meaning if things are slow at Marvel or DC or any of the (laughs) other things you can always come here and do some work and people would (laughs) and so like uh that was the thing that uh, I tried to stress in the book. It's like every gold and silver age comic book artist at one point or another 
had their foot in the door at Harvey. And it's yeah. just because they always had an open door policy to give people work to anything. It sounds like maybe in the animation, it's kind of more like Hanna-Barbera was that way yeah. than anybody yeah. else. But, yeah. you know. Yeah, Filmation too, but but Hanna-Barbera especially. I mean, yeah. um, like Chuck, uh, Chuck Jones is crew that you know did grinch and you know all, all, all his famous stuff um uh, uh, uh you, you know he he had a studio down in hollywood but but he couldn't he couldn't promise year-round work yeah he would he would get a a, a a tv special and then when he gets the special he would hire people and 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 um so all the, his artists would work at hannah barbera <laughs> and then and then and then Chuck would sell a script to ABC or something, you know, for for, for a TV for a special, and then he'd send up the bat signal or something, you know, and then yeah. they would all they would all you know give their notice and they would go to Chuck and do this do the special and then all come back, and and Bill and Joe didn't care, you yeah. know, like they, they were just like, no, you know, I'd, I'd rather have him here working, you know, you know, so yeah and to patty freeling was more like chuck jones too it's like that was seasonal yeah. work so it's like uh unless you were art leonardi or somebody that was always on staff you know it's like yeah. uh yeah. you know everybody else you know had to freelance around you know and so it sounds like you were doing that too so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it yeah yeah you know and again too like you know we pick up people from from you know got laid off a of back or got laid off a of bluth or something you know and then you know you know when when you know black cauldron uh, the staff got very big to finish cauldron mm -hmm. and then when cauldron was over like we got a lot of people you know and over at filmation you know and they were they were happy for the work mm -hmm. you know the, you know the weird thing too about bill and joe were so uh you know in tune with uh i think they had some kind of relationship with disney's or something because one of my friends who was a trainee at at, at, at disney studio uh you, you know you know he was in that whole group of like john musker and brad bird and henry Selleck and stuff you know that that whole group there that became you know the the the, the lions of the, the disney renaissance but um he got fed up, uh, you know, he decided he wanted to move on and he gave notice to Disney studios to say, you know, I'm quitting. And, and, and he says that day he went back to his desk and to pack up. And while he's packing up, the phone rings and he picks up the phone and it's Hannah Barbera. <laughs> <laughs> you know, do you need a job? I was like, <laughs> you know, apparently they, they had some sort of like direct line or something, you know, between, between the studios and all. So. Right. Um, is there any current animation studio that's kind of like that, or is it really more segmented, like yeah, more than, um, or splintered more than ever nowadays? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for a little while, uh, you know, there's a lot of us working at Disney Feature. Then for a little while, uh, there was a lot of people at at Disney Television, people yeah. doing Disney TV, and then um, uh, recently there was a lot of people at Netflix. So they're, they're like, oh, where's James Baxter? He's on Netflix. Oh, where's Glenn Keane? He's on Netflix. You know, that was like one. And and um, now a, a, a lot of people are helping out on The Simpsons also. So, mm. you know, it's just, it's a, you know, just a, people like the steadiness of it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of segued over to teaching just because, um, uh, you know, in, in 2010 and everything, you, you know, it was like hustling around projects and things and stuff didn't start to happen. And, um uh, you know and, and my wife came back one day and i was always teaching one night a week uh, you know mm -hmm. and, and and my my wife said to me one day she said you know you come back from the studio and you bitch 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 <laughs> and then you come back from from, from school and you go, how's class you know i had fun I said, well maybe it's telling you something you go, yeah yeah it's time <laughs> <laughs> you know so so i became full-time and i thought mm -hmm. you know i've got i've got um whatever it is like 32 movies and 22 tv series and i don't know how many commercials and it's mm -hmm. like that's enough it, 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 you know like you know let, let some young people start to do it you know and and it makes me feel good when i when i know the people that i trained and stuff like go out and and, uh, and do great things too so mm -hmm. so on your teaching career is it has it always been at usc or have you taught elsewhere Oh yeah, no, no, I bounced around a lot. I, oh, okay. um, I, I started at a little school called Brandis, which was like a little professional, uh, a little mm -hmm. private professional school in the in, in the San Fernando Valley. And um, but I've taught at UCLA, I taught at Cal Arts, uh, I taught at uh, a, uh, AFI, I taught at Noman, you know, uh, um, you, you know, a bunch of Santa Monica College, Woodbury. But um, you know, when USC called, I said, okay, 
this is USC, you know, this isn't like Joe Bob's film school, you know, this is like, <laughs> it's like, like, we're not kidding. Well, <laughs> you know, UCLA's like, not bad either. I oh, yeah, UCLA's yeah. terrific. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. they're the great stuff too, yeah. you know. Cal and, Arts, and, and, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, Cal Arts also, yeah, yeah, they're wonderful. But it's, but it's like, uh, you know, they offer me more money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That sounds like, because yeah. Chico needed the money. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you yeah. heard that, the, Old yeah, Gilbert yeah. Godfrey doing old Groucho. Anyway, enough yeah, of that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Chico yeah, needs the money. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah. but then, uh, it, yeah, but then I thought, you know, and um, yeah, that it, it, it's it's a very good program, and it's funny because you know you don't think of USC really because uh, in animation there's always Cal Arts, Cal Arts, Cal Arts. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know? And 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 there is a the, they do have a terrific program, and I was very proud to to, to teach there. But you know, when you SC is saying like, well, well, these guys go back to the silent era, you know, and, and it's like, and a lot of uh, Hollywood celebs, you know, you know, like uh, um, uh, it was Art Cloakey came up with Gumby, mm -hmm. a, a, like, and, and as his student film, like that was his yeah. thesis film in 1957, and uh, <laughs> and Melendez taught there for a while, yeah. and um, uh, you know, um, which uh, George Lucas's first film as a student was an animated film. Yeah, the thing called "Look at Life," you know, which is like he he just mm -hmm. was the photograph. You know, he he shot uh, stills of photographs. Yeah, and did a photo montage of it. Spielberg but, was there too, right? Yeah. Um, no, actually, he couldn't get in and everything. Oh, he went to, I didn't he went know to Long Beach that's... State. Yeah, oh. it's it's funny because he's got his name on a building. Yeah, like, yeah. So that's I was sure, and I should know this, but I oh, didn't. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, and as far as your teaching goes, is it just teaching fundamentals of animation, or what types of things have you taught over um, the years? I teach. Uh, yeah, I started with fundamentals of animation. I also teach fundamentals of storyboard, and uh, now I teach animation history, and 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 also you know because of um, you know my book on computer history, oh, yeah. because you know actually when I was writing um, yeah this one yeah you know this one about uh, yes. yeah yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, what I found interesting was when I was writing uh, draw, drawing a line, I, I, I thought I needed to explain the digital the digital transition to say yeah. how it changed it, you know the the fundamental nature of the business and all. Yeah. And I did a lot of research into digital and and that chapter started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then my my editor, thank goodness, said to me, "You got a new book here." And it's like, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay. <laughs> and I thought, well, I know all those guys, you know, I mean, I remember when, when, uh, he, you know, when Pixar was getting started and I remember seeing the early experimental films and, and actually, uh, working for Seamus, uh, uh, you know, I dedicated the book to Seamus, uh, mm -hmm. because, because when I was, uh, when I was working for him, Seamus used to go over to the New York Institute of Technology mm -hmm. and, and, and watch them, uh, do early experiments in, in creating, uh, uh computer animation. And these kids like, you know, Ed Catmull, <laughs> you, know, you know, Lauren Carpenter and Ralph Guggenheim. So mm -hmm. the people who became the main technology of, uh, of Pixar were all learned their stuff working at New York Tech. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and and it was there was like this rogue millionaire like Dr. Alexander Shore who wanted to make a CG feature like 20 years before Toy Story. Mm -hmm. It was like in the mid 70s. He wanted to do this. And, mm -hmm. But but uh, Seamus would would be there. And and then he would um, uh, he come back to the office, and I was sitting there working, and he was working at his typewriter, you know, writing, uh, you know, his you know, talking animals, you know, his first book, and, you know, and and Seamus would look up at me, and he goes, you know, computers are coming, it's gonna change everything, the business will never be the same, and I'm like, that's nice, old man, lie down, you know, <laughs> <laughs> have some Wheatina, you, you know, it's like. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, but he was right. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. he was, you know, here's this guy who started in silent film and did some of the earliest TV commercials telling me everything's going to go digital. And like, yeah. you know, so when I, so when I started writing the, the, the CG book, it was almost like a lot of the uh, pioneers that I talked to who had done the earliest experimental CG work, they couldn't quite believe that I was writing a history. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, guys, uh, Jurassic Park was like uh, 20 years ago. <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah. It is time, isn't it? <laughs> go, yep. Yeah, if yep. you don't write this stuff down now, you know. And one of the one of the senior design this guy named Bill Kovacs, who was like one of the senior designers of Maya, Autodesk Maya, uh, uh, died suddenly. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and uh, still at a comparatively young age. And that kind of like got everybody thinking, oh, shit, we better start writing it. <laughs> now, um, I haven't read that book. I probably should. But yeah. um, okay. it's like the first uh, computer animation I'm aware of is like on the earliest Sesame Streets and stuff like that, where they have numbers that flip around. It's very rudimental stuff. But is that considered like the first computer yeah, animation? There is. Yeah. 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 That, that's somebody like early late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. 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 That's the earliest. I, I, I mean, here's a great piece of trivia. The very first computer animation on a feature length film, the opening titles of Hitchcock's Vertigo. Oh, wow. Because what happened was uh, John Whitney, John Whitney Sr., who's considered the father of computer animation, yeah. was was an experimental filmmaker in the 40s. Like he was like working in Grauman or something. And, and, and he worked at UPA also. Uh-huh. And, 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 and he was doing his experiments with with non-objective non-traditional you know filmmaking like streaking mm. colors and things under the camera and stuff and 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 he bought a lot of world war ii army surplus you know junk and stuff like 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 radio scopes and spectrometers and stuff and and, and he he bought um he bought a a a, a, a um a, a navy surplus bomb site a, a gun site that it was like an early computer that actually uh, uh sort of would sync up anti-aircraft guns to all point at the same plane uh, mm. you know as, as they were going by and and anyway it, this is in his garage in altadena so he and his younger brother are like rewiring this computer and stuff and they created a proto analog computer like a pre-computer computer mm. And at that time, Hitchcock was using Saul Bass, who was a friend of mine, right. and 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 uh, and and wanted something different for Vertigo for the opening credits. Hmm. So Saul hired John Whitney and everything to make those spiral things coming out of Kim Novak's eyes. Hmm. I mean, they barely moved that little spider yeah, 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 you got to start somewhere. You know, yeah, you know. yeah. Well, the, so, the the earliest I've heard of on movies, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, or, you know, is in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Yes, seventy one. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. has like when the Oompa Loompas are singing, and they have what do you do when your kid yeah. is a brat, and it makes like yeah. a what word like that. Yeah. That yeah. was computer generated. So yeah, that was computer generated. Yeah, okay. I'm having a brain fart right now, so I don't I, I remember the, the exact name of it. But uh, oh, uh, no, no, it's not it. But uh, but the thing that I found fascinating when I was doing the computer book was that um, normal film history stuff is is pretty linear, you know, which is like trick films, and then you get into doing entertainment films connected with comics, uh, then Walt Disney, and, and you know, and it's pretty you know uh, cg is more difficult because you've got you've got experimental filmmakers uh you've got scientists working on on <laughs> digital programs you've got the government you know the government put a lot of money in flight simulators mm-hmm. flight sims you know because like when flight sims started at, like during world war ii it was like a, a a pilot you know would get in this like um wooden box on on tire springs and they <laughs> shake it and they go i'm flying a plane you know yeah. <laughs> like you know by the end of world war ii you got supersonic jets and bombers you know you can't you got to train people better so they came up with simulators you know and and the, the government put a lot of money in graphics so that when you turn the wheel of your plane the graphics move you know, which now it's like nothing. But back then, that was a super complicated algorithm, you know. And so there was that stuff. And uh, they used to call it spook work. You know, like you do government work and stuff. Like even Pixar did spook work. You, mm-hmm. you know, that, you know, it, it paid the bills, you know. Right. But, uh, but then, uh, so there's all these different, you know, and there's people, the games is another realm and visual effects is another realm. And then around the 80s, they all start to, congeal you know they all started to become you know fine um i was talking with a friend who was a producer at uh at digital productions and and, and she said my final revenge is i can walk right on the street right now and stop somebody and say do you know what cgi is and they go yeah computer graphics he goes in 1984 let me know what the hell you were talking about <laughs> It made no sense, you know. <laughs> I think I did, but I was following it, so you know I knew about okay. uh, what Tron did, and you know yeah. the earliest Pixar stuff with you know Tin Toy, or even before that when they just had like the juggling, uh, you know, oh, yeah, things yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. That, yeah. That early stuff. So yeah, yeah, I'm gonna have to take a look at that book. Um, so yeah, how yeah. many books have you done? I, I I think I count four or five. 
Yeah, about five, about okay. five books. Like yeah, so you have drawing yeah. the line, moving into innovation, history of computer animation, eat, drink, animate. Oh and, yeah, yeah, the, the cookbook and yeah. timing for animation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I mean, the, the fun thing about the cookbook was, you know, when I assisted Grim Natwick, and, and, you know, at that first time, uh, I, I, as, as a present gift, uh, Grim gave me his chili recipe. <laughs> and and he's from uh, you know he's from Missouri and he's very proud of his chili recipe and stuff so we have grim you know and and then um when I was when I was uh hanging out in Japan uh, uh you know helping judge the Nagoya festival uh, uh one of the producers at at um at Ghibli gave me Miyazaki's recipe for ramen and I said, okay, I got a ramen, you know, and, you know, and then I thought, well, you, you know, I, I, I got a recipe from uh, from Bill Hanna, and I got a recipe from Chuck Jones, and I thought, and I was joking with um, John Alberto Bendazzi, the, uh, the Italian hist animation historian, and I said, you know, um, I can write a cookbook, and he goes, that's an incredible idea, <laughs> like, oh, okay, so once I started asking people, you know, I called up you know, you know, Linda Jones, like Chuck's daughter, and 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 called up, you know, the the Bill Hanna's family, and I said, "Did your dad have a favorite recipe?" And and it turned out a bunch of them did. You know, oh, you know, well, uh, Benny Washam, who was the um, uh, uh, animator for Chuck and everything, uh, uh, he liked to cook. Mm. You know, and and suddenly it's like everybody had a recipe. You know, for, for stuff, and you know, and, and you know, and it's not like um, some stuff is complicated. Some of it's like it's very simple. Yeah. It, it, you know, like uh, John Kimball told me, Ward Kimball's idea of dinner was open up a can of hash, throw in some peanuts, dinner. You know, so it was fun just collecting all these stories. Is that in the book? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. There, yeah. There was, there was a guy, too, um, who directed uh, uh, um, death metal videos. Uh, his name was John Schnepp, and uh, he's passed away, unfortunately. He's a young man, but but he gave me a recipe for something called picklebacks, mm. which is which is a shot of bourbon and a shot of pickle juice. Like throw back one, throw back the other. <laughs> Odd. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, I, I, and you know the, the other thing too was that also about with cartoons is uh, I got Mary Blair's martini. I have Mark Davis's martini. <laughs> you know, everybody's martini. <laughs> yeah, it's like you know, like like Grim Natwick said, you haven't uh, you haven't lived until you had a Mary Blair martini. It's like it's really like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so, have you tried most of these recipes yourself? Oh, just yeah. Say, oh okay. yeah. Are you oh, a yeah. uh, uh, like cook on the side, or you just like I, to I, eat? <laughs> I just like to eat. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, and I like to tell stories, and yeah. and, and and you know, um. Uh, I, a good friend of mine, Robert Lentz. Uh, uh, Robert was the head of story uh, was the head of story artist on Toy Story, and and we worked together on Shrek and stuff. And and he studied to be a professional cook, so so he helped me with a lot of the recipes. He like tested a lot of the recipes and stuff, and then oh. you know, and we worked them all out together and stuff. And uh, Bruno Bozzetto sent me a pasta. Um, Michael oh. G. You know, sent me some pasta. So, I think so I have to let this book up too. <laughs> Yeah, 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 I didn't I even I, know you did this. I didn't know yeah. that you did the. I did know you did the computer animation one. Yeah, I just haven't looked yeah. it up before. So, but yeah, anyway. like I was looking at the list and I was thinking, like, I got eight Oscar winners, you know, with recipes, and about five uh, Emmy winners. Stuff, Interesting stuff, uh, yeah. on the list. So, and and it's just yeah, and like I said, and, and the recipes go from very simple to very complex. So, mm -hmm. depending on how you know, like House and Bachelor sent me, you know, a recipe for beef bourguignon, and it's like. Uh, <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> Yeah, very cool. Well, um, I could probably talk to you for hours, but I don't want to keep you forever <laughs> here. We'd, um, uh, I guess the question would be, uh, I mean, I know you're teaching and everything nowadays. Uh, but do you make any public appearances or uh, anything like that at the to these days? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, like if I get invited to speak some places, and okay. and you know, I mean, with the with the COVID lockdown, it's been a little more right. difficult. Yeah, get around. But uh, but, but I start asking now, and people go, "Oh yeah, I'm going to San Diego Comic Convention. I'm doing oh, yeah, this. I'm doing yeah. that. Whatever." Are, are you? Do you have anything in the plans for the next few months uh, or no? no? I mean, I'll probably be at the Annie Awards because it's the 50th anniversary and all that's that's it. And and I've been working with the with the Academy Museum and the Motion Picture mm -hmm. and stuff. I'm, I'm, you know, make sure animation's represented. You know, you know we have a lot of stuff there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, and I always talk to them about how you know the differences between 
successful museums and unsuccessful museums you know like uh like i noticed like i admire like the disney family museum mm -hmm. you know you, you know I, I when i first heard about it i thought oh like 11 rooms of family photos you know what it's, yeah. but um they it's do a, a good, good job museum. yeah they I did like a it. really good job you know they pushed and you know and and i noticed that good museums are always changing they're always yeah. they're always new shows and new things and you know uh down here i remember in san bernardino they had a roy rogers museum oh yeah i yeah. wish i'd seen that one i didn't yeah <laughs> I, and it was just like the contents of his garage you know he had like his, <laughs> he had like his fly fishing poles and his kiwanis <laughs> club memberships and, you know, and they never uh, changed it then it was that, never the no you know and then yeah. after you saw it you saw it and that was yeah, it yeah. you know and, and eventually i guess like you know a, a generation of people have come in who don't know who he is you know yeah. Just like the Liberace Museum in, in, in Las Vegas, I think, had to close yeah. because the modern generation, they, they never heard of these people. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like your your father telling us about, you know, um, uh, your parents telling you about like Sophie Tucker and Ted Lewis. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, my, my old man was a jitterbug and, you know, he, he told me stories about Kay Kaiser and uh, <laughs> College of Musical Knowledge, you know, I'm just like. <laughs> whatever <laughs> no i know, yeah, I know yeah, exactly yeah. yeah yeah but the disney family museum is is aggressively they keep it they keep it moving and they keep it yeah. they keep being relevant and stuff so yeah. so yeah i was saying with these guys uh, you know with the, with the marsh picture museum that like yeah, yeah we got to keep doing shows and we got to keep you know keep serving the community and working with the community and stuff and mm -hmm. and, and and teaching people because it's not like um you know like i, I used to joke about um our generation, uh, 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 our generation kind of grew up on old movies. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Martin Scorsese once said, uh, he said, everybody who watched like Million Dollar Movie when they were a kid, uh, you, know, you know, got a college level university uh, film course. Mm -hmm. You know, you came home from school and there's Bringing Up Baby or Friendly yeah. Persuasion or How Green Was My Valley, you know. Or, yeah. and, and I said, students don't have that nowadays. Yeah. You, you know, so but we got to keep showing them like this is this is why this stuff is is great you know and yeah. should be remembered so. now, i grew up in the san francisco bay area and they had what was known as the 330 movie yeah you know, they heavily edited each thing because the time slot was only 90 minutes and most films uh -huh. were <laughs> around 90 yeah. minutes so they always cut something out but i didn't yeah. know that at the time and also there was no home video so i mean you had to to get what you got <laughs> yeah, so yeah. anyway yeah I mean, I mean that was it you know and and i didn't really notice this till like um one time i was working on a tv special and 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 my assistant was like a a 20 something and i was making i was making some sort of allusion to like laurel and hardy you know and and they and she said well i wasn't born when they were doing it and i oh. said well i wasn't born either they're, yeah. they're, it's still great stuff yeah I always it's hate still, that excuse. It's like it's, it's easier now than ever to see most things. I mean, there's some things that are just gone, you know, but I mean, you know, compared to when you and I were kids, you know, it's like the accessibility to so many things is like, oh, oh there it is, you know. And you, 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 you know, and, and and you know, the old animators, you know, the folks like you know, Chuck Jones and Frizz and stuff would say, but they uh, adored the 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 silent comedians they studied harold lloyd and studied chaplin and studied mm -hmm. Keaton and everything and they 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 obsessed over that and stuff you know yeah. you know and they want to learn the, the tricks of timing you know you know how to how, how, how to get a laugh just with a timing joke and stuff mm -hmm. so yeah you know, but anyway all right yeah just, okay well if uh people want to get in contact with you or ask you a question or you know uh or yeah, how, yeah. how do they get copies of your books i assume they're on print yeah. i don't know yeah yeah oh yeah oh, oh yeah they're all still out and everything yeah they're all on amazon or whatever mm -hmm. you, know, you know whatever you want to get barnes and noble you, you know they're all there you know and and uh the nicest compliment i got about my writing was was uh was a fe another historian said it, it it reads like the way you talk <laughs> Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. I've gotten that compliment about my book. So right. I, I'm happy with that one. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's funny. Cause like I've had the opposite problem in the university. Cause like when I was, when I was like, uh, you know, trying to, to, to get a promotion, you know, for tenure and things like that. Uh, uh, the Dean once told me, he said, um, um, it, I, I read your dissertation and uh, there's one thing that I think you need to work on. I said, mm -hmm. what's that? He goes, 
you're too readable it's too easy you know okay. <laughs> you, you have to infuse a more academic idiom in uh. your in your polemic <laughs> like 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 don't say something's real say it has a veristic verisimilitude you know oh brother <laughs> i'm sorry i don't know what people understand <laughs> what <I'm saying>. <laughs> so. Forgive me for making it readable. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, that's, anyway. that's just, anyway. hmm. all right. So if people wanted to get in contact with you, how would you, how would they do that then? Oh, I say check my website. You know, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook, I'm on all that stuff. You know, all right. Very cool. Well, I want to thank you, Tom, for being my special guest. I learned more about you, and I'm going to definitely get the cookbook and the <laughs> the computer animation book. Um, and uh, that pretty much wraps it up for another episode of the Fun Ideas Podcast. And okay. we will see you next time. Okay. Take care. It was, it was great being on. Thanks.